All right. Now, uh, I've got, uh, somebody was asking, have we actually gotten far enough along to do your homework for tonight? And the answer is, by the time we're at the end of this lecture today, we will have shown the, ma the material for your homework assignment tonight. So you can have an extra day, okay? So for assignment, which assignment is that? Assignment um, 20, man, we're 22. in the 20s now. Man, we've done a... <laughs> assignment 22. 22, yeah. And actually, this is just, this is just another translate, translate one that's in the... Um, I think it's translate one that's in the book, I'm pretty sure. So, and it's also, you don't need to do a Java one this time, it's just C minus um, minus. So, let's continue on. Uh, we're talking about semaphores, and um, we had concluded our class last time with um, uh, showing how semaphores, how you do semaphores in C minus minus. And now today what we're going to do is we'll, we'll do a code walkthrough. I don't think I'm going to take time to actually demo the Java semaphore, but you, you've got all the code online. You can demo it yourself. It's just, it's, it's not too exciting. So we're, we'll just do a code walkthrough of the, of, of, the, of the, how to do semaphores in Java. Now actually let me uh, say something about this, about semaphores in Java. For many, many years, Java did not have semaphores. They did not provide that. They, you know, and, but Java has always had concurrency. They've always had a concurrency model and they have always provided concurrency. But they didn't, for many years, they didn't, they didn't provide semaphores. And they provided, so here's previews of coming attractions. We're doing semaphores now. The next chapter of what we're going to learn is a new improved way of do, dealing with concurrency called a monitor. Okay, and Java has always had their own version of monitors, and so they just kind of like thought the original designers thought, well, that's good enough. And uh, but semaphores are so common, and when when in in the past, you, you I, I would use I would use monitors to implement semaphores, and then teach my own implementation of the semaphore semaphores in Java that way. Here, but now. Just in the last, I forget how many years ago it was. It, I mean, it was you know maybe three or four, or maybe even less than that, years ago. Now semaphores are in are in the uh, Java library. So, but here's what you here's what we need to know about how to use semaphores in Java. First of all, in the constructor, the constructor has two parameters. The first parameter is the integer value of s dot v. Okay, so that's pretty usual. But, but the second parameter is optional. And do you remember the difference between fair scheduling? Um, do you remember what we meant? Well, it's true, okay. If you put true as a second parameter, that is fair scheduling, and that means FIFO, first in, first out. Do you remember we said that um, our author uses a set of processes that are blocked and he just says, well, you just pick one. If you do a signal and there's a, process, there's a bunch of processes that are, in the, that are blocked, you, don't, you can't predict which one gets picked by the scheduler. Well, that's the case in Java. If you don't specify true for the second parameter, then you do, it's not predictable which one's going to get picked the operating system, the scheduler will decide, okay? So um, if you want it to be FIFO, you have to put true. And furthermore, the default value is false. So it's not like if you leave it out, it's going to be strong. If you leave it out, you, it's not going to be strong. So that's one thing about semaphores in Java, all right? Now here's another thing about semaphores in Java. You don't use the keyword wait. Instead, you use the keyword acquire. And whereas in C minus in minus, we would say wait S, where S is the semaphore. Here, if S is the semaphore, you do, it's S dot acquire. So it's, it, it, there's a semaphore class that we use. And it's, now, why do we call it acquire instead of wait? Well, because, you know, when you, ex 
when, when a process executes wait, will it necessarily wait? Yeah, not necessarily. If the value, if the integer value is is like positive, it'll just do what? Subtract one from it and just not wait. <laughs> you see what I mean? So wait, you know, when, when we say wait, we mean well, potentially wait. But so the reason they use acquire, it's like acquiring a lock. You see what I mean? You acquire or you acquire permission or you, you acquire the lock. And then and then signal, instead of saying signal, they say, oh, release. So now we're going to release the lock so someone else can have the lock. Or maybe we could say, maybe the lock's not the right word. Maybe we could say key. Well, but you're acquiring the key and using it in the lock and then, well, I don't know whether. <laughs> but anyway, you see, you see what the, the intent is on that wording, okay? And another thing to realize that when we demo, if, we were, if you go and demo that algorithm 6.1 in Java, is that the output statements are rarely intermingled because the processor is so fast that the probability of an output statement completing in one single time slice is, is very, very high. So you hardly ever get any output statements intermingled. So here's the code for algorithm 6.1 in Java. So um, now look, you guys. It's part of the library. So when you use a semaphore in Java, you have to say import java.util.concurrent.star. So that's all the libraries. That's, so that's all the items in the java.util.concurrent library. The star is a wildcard that, in, that, you, that imports all of them. So, and because that library is where the semaphore, semaphores are defined, okay? And here we, see, here we have, so there's just our, our standard stat, uh, static volatile int, int. Now what does static mean? One per class instead of one per process. And some people, you know, I noticed, you know, on your on some people's code, you forgot to do make forgot to make the um, the protocol variables static, and so there was one per there was one per object, and then the code didn't work actually. So anyway, so and now um, and check this out. So static, one per class, static semaphore, and it's just capital S semaphore, and that's built, that's what we import from here. And so here we have uh, S gets new semaphore, so lowercase s gets new semaphore, one. So one is it's initialized, the value of the semaphore is initialized to one. And then we don't have static in front of our uh, process ID because we need one process ID per class, or sorry, per object. Are you with, per instance? Are, we, are you with me on that? And then here's our usual identifying the process you know, setting the process ID to um, in the constructor, and so look. So here's what we. So here's what we do. Our pre. So here's the code. So we have this temp and delay. You know, we have to mess with these delay statements to see how the concurrency works. And here's our non-critical section. And look, here's the critical section. So what do we do? We do s dot acquire. Are you with me? And then there's our critical section. And here's our temp or delay. And then temp gets in. Delay n gets temp plus one and s.release, and that's it. So that's how you do it in Java. And the rest of this is the same. The main program is the same. Are we good? Now, what kind of a semaphore is this that we allocated here? Is it strong or weak? Is this semaphore s strong or weak? Yeah, it's weak because we didn't specify a second parameter. So there's a default, it's using the default parameter. So if you wanted to make it strong, you'd have to put comma true. Is everybody with me on that? Okay, so that's, and I don't think I'll bother a demo, giving the demo on that. Okay, so now here's the next little section of material shows how to prove um, Correctness, without going through and you know, model. You know, does everyone understand what model checking is? Model checking is when we do the states and we draw the state transition diagram and we do it all out. And and there are tools to help you do that. But you know, that's one way to do. That's kind of like a brute force way. But then we also want to be able to do a little bit higher level reasoning about invariance. About uh, all right now, this. Um, Theorem 6.1 is specifically is um, actually this theorem 6.1 is general. 
So it's not specifically related to our algorithm. All right, this is a general, this is the general theorem, theorem 6.1. And here's the, here is the theorem. It says, first of all, let k be the initial value of s dot v. So that's, so whenever we initialize our semaphore, let's let k be the value. Uh, the examples that we've used up until now, k has been 1. But we'll have some, in, some examples in the future where it'll be different from 1. Okay. And, um, and this pound signal s, that's the number of signal statements executed. And pound weight s is the number of weight statements. Now look at here, you guys. It's not the number of weight statements executed. It's the number of weight statements what? Completely executed. Now, when we have a prime on the, you know, like when we, if we, remember when we had like P2 prime, what did that mean? It's on hold. That's exactly what it meant. Okay, so it's on hold. It was on hold. And now, had had has in that state has weight executed? Yes or no? Well, let me rephrase it. Has weight completely executed? Yes or no? No, it doesn't completely execute until somebody else does what? Signals, and then the weight has completely executed. Does everybody see what I mean? So that's how we interpret pound weight S. Okay, it's the number of weight statements completely executed. And now, so these are just definitions. This is the theorem. The theorem is the following expressions are invariant. S dot V is always greater than or equal to zero. Do you believe that? Why do you, do you believe that S dot V is always greater than or equal to zero? Why is that? Can you, can you, re remembering what, what uh, weight and signal do? Why is that? Anybody want to argue why that is? Yeah. Yeah, but why can't you keep, why can't, why can't, uh, wait, what subtracts from it? Weight or signal? <coughs> weight subtracts from it. So why can't a bunch of weights happen and make it go negative? Well, you're not necessarily waiting. If the semaphore has the value 7 and you execute a weight, that makes it 6. So if another process comes along and does another and executes another weight, why can't you just keep wait, 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 why can't you keep executing wait, 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 wait? Well, anyway, it says it only subtracts one if, zero, if s dot v is greater than zero. Yeah. It only subtracts one if s dot v is greater than zero. Are you with me? So in that case, if weight is zero and you execute weight, what will happen? It will get suspended, but at that point, weight has not completely been executed yet, but still, it'll be suspended, right? So yeah, that's how you would argue that. And now here's the other one. S dot V equals K plus the number of, number of signal statements executed minus the number of weight statements completely executed. Now, do you see, can you see why, why this is? Because every time you do a what? Every time you do a, a signal, what do you do? You add one to V, and every time you do a weight, you do what? Subtract. But every time you do a complete weight, you know, you subtract one. And furthermore, it starts off to be the value K. So here, so so we can prove we can prove these simply by mathematical induction. And you have already told me the idea, the idea behind the proof. So how do you prove that s dot v is greater than zero? Weight s only subtracts one from s dot v when s dot v is greater than zero. Signal s only adds one when the queue is empty. So that's the idea behind that proof. And then why is it that s dot v is k plus the number of, number of signal statements executed minus the number of weight statements completely executed? Because if weight s blocks a process, it does not subtract one from s dot v, but it's executed, has not completed. We just, yeah, are we good? Okay, so that's theorem 6.1. Okay, now, <clears throat> what we want to do is we are going to use this, um, that 
lemma that uh, those invariants to prove the correctness of um, to prove the correctness of our solution to the critical section problem with semaphores. Okay, and this so this will involve higher level higher level reasoning using that, and, and as opposed to the state uh, analysis of the state transition diagrams. So so here so here we have this is an abbreviated version. Algorithm 6.2 is an abbreviation of algorithm 6.1. So what? So look, we have loop forever, and then what? P1 weight s, P2 signal s, and then for Q loop forever Q1 weight s, Q2 signal s. Are you with me? And so now, what are the three things that we have to? What are the three things we have to reason about to prove correctness? Mutual exclusion, deadlock free, starvation free. So we'll do those three. So here we go. So now, let pound CS be the number of processes in their critical sections. Now, does this raise a red flag? What do we, if pound CS is the number that are in the critical section, what do we want that number to be? One or zero. We don't want it to be greater than one. We don't want it to be two, right? So, so. That's, that's, that's why that's an important number to think about. It zero, one, yeah. we, that's what we would like in order for it to ha in order for it to be what? No, no, no. We want, <laughs> that's, sorry. Why, why is this number of importance to us? Let pound CS be the number of processes in their critical sections. Oh, that's right. My, I was, I was confused. You see, you see, the reason it's an important number is because we want, we, we want to prove that it's, that, it's, <laughs> that it's less than or equal to one. Yeah. Because if it's not less than or equal to one, then more than one process can be in this critical, yeah. by definition, more than, by the definition of C, you know, all right? So that's why it's important to us. Now, to prove that, first we're going to prove a little lemma. Pound CS plus S dot V equals one. Now you remember that in this in this in this code that we're that we're analyzing, we here it says binary semaphore s gets one and then the empty cube, right? So our initial value here is is uh, is one. Then our initial value of s dot v is one, right? And we're claiming that for this code, pound c s plus s dot v equals one. So how are we going to prove that? Actually, we're going to do it slightly differently. Okay, so now look. Do you see that from the code of, we're going to do code inspection first. Do you see that from the code of algorithm 6.2, the number of processes that are in the critical section equals the number of weight executed minus the number signal executed. Now, why is that? How can we know that from code inspection? Because how do you get into your critical section? You have to execute wait. And then whenever you leave the critical section, what, do you, what, what happens? You execute, in order to leave critical section, you execute what? Signal. Signal. Are you with me? So, the number of, of pro and, and furthermore, we start outside, you know, we start out, you know, with P1 is about to be executed and Q1 is about to be executed. And no, L and no processes are in their critical sections. So, does everybody, do, do you see them from code inspection, the number of processes in their critical section is, is the number, in, number of weights executed minus the number of signals executed. But this weights means number of weights completely, yeah? Are we good? Now, what did theorem 6.1 say? What was theorem 6.1? So therefore, um, I, I, that was the first part of it. And what was the second part of it? <coughs> yeah, and that's right. And what is K in this example? And in this problem, what is K? It's one. So what did that make it? Is this right? Because, because it said number of weight minus number of signal is what? 
with these one. I mean, yeah. Well, with a little higher level math. Yeah. <laughs> Is everybody good? Yep. So that says number CS equals 1 minus S dot V, and therefore CS plus S dot V is 1. More, some more high level math here. Is everybody good with that? So the number, so the number it is, so there's that. Okay, so now how do we prove mutual exclusion? By the previous lemma, the number of items in the critical section is 1 minus S dot V. But what do we know about S dot V? It's what? By that theorem, what is S dot V? It's greater than two. So if you take one minus a number, that is what? If you take one minus a number, that is what? Greater than or equal to zero. Then what do you know about that? What do you know about that? It's it's less than it's less than or equal to one. Are you with me? So there's just a little bit. So there it is. Ah, oh, the number in the critical section is less than or equal to one. Boom. So therefore we have what? Mutual exclusion. Are you with me? Does everybody see how that works? Okay. Now, how about deadlock free? Now what now in order from now, how can it deadlock? What has to be the state in order for it to deadlock? I mean, what has to be true for it to deadlock? Yeah, they have to be stuck. Right. So let's do some code inspection. So if, in order to have deadlock, that implies by code inspection, inspection that what? P1 and Q1 are both blocked. Are you with me? So, so they, now, now the, only way they can be, the only way they can be blocked is if what? Is, is if S dot V equals zero. Right? Because that's how you get blocked is by, yeah? Okay? is by having s dot v. So by code inspection, p1 and q1 are both blocked and s dot v equals zero. But now, what did we say by, by our lemma? What did we say our lemma was? Number c s plus s dot v equals what? One. So therefore, what do we know? s dot v is zero, so therefore, what do we know? If s dot v is zero, then what do we have? then the number in the critical section is one. But wait, we said that's, we said that it had to be this. So that's a contradiction. We said that, we said that neither one is in their critical section, but if neither one is in their critical section, by this logic, one of them has to be in the critical section. Look how short that is. Is that slick? Okay. And actually, we could have just skipped that one and done the starvation-free one, you know, by, because we know that starvation-free implies deadlock-free. But let's do it. Okay, so to prove that algorithm 6.2 is starvation-free, we are first going to assume that P is starved, and we will show that it leads to a contradiction. So now, if P is starved, then that implies that it's blocked in the queue, right? But if it's blocked, we know that the state of the semaphore must be, the state of the semaphore Q, it either has to have P in it or both P and Q in it. Those are the only two possibilities because there's only two processes in this program, P and Q. And, but furthermore, we know also that the integer variable part of the semaphore, the S dot V, has to be zero because that is the only way that a process can be blocked is if s dot v is zero because of the semantics of the weight statement. But on the other hand, we just proved this great lemma that says that the number of processes that are in the critical section is equal to one minus s dot v. And regardless of which of those two situations states that we have in the previous line, s dot v is zero, so one minus zero is one. So what that's telling us is that the number of critical sections, the number of processes in the critical section is one. So there is one process in its critical section. But wait a minute. Of those two possibilities that we had before, that means that it must be the first possibility. In other words, because there's only two processes, Q must be in its critical section, and it's that first possibility that we must have. In other words, 
only P must be blocked. Both P and Q cannot be blocked because of that, because of our lemma. So it must be only P that is blocked. But wait a minute, if only P is blocked, that means that Q is in its critical section. But what have we always assumed happens when a process is in its critical section? It must complete. And therefore, Q must execute. But when it executes, what does it do? It executes signal S. But what does signal S do? It looks to see if the Q of blocked processes is empty. And because it's not, it has P in it. Then it sets P to the run state, to the ready, to the ready state, and P can eventually enter its critical section and therefore is not starved. Great proof that's dependent upon this lemma that the number of processes in the critical section is 1 minus S dot V. Okay, so see how, see how easy it is to reason, see how easy it is to reason about, oops, um, using semaphores with this very simple, with these very simple invariants. All right. Now, haha, -ha, you asked the other day about um, what about more than one process? Uh, sorry, what about more than two processes? And I kind of put you off a little bit. I, put, I didn't answer that it completely. But it, it would be very difficult to generalize Decker's algorithm for more than two processes. Okay? And there are software solutions that do that. But look at this. Look at algorithm 6.3. This is the critical section problem with semaphores with any number of processes. So, namely, capital N processes. Okay? And what happens is the way you do it is their code is all the same. There's just one semaphore that's shared by all of them. Are you with me? And if it's guaranteed atomic, the weight in the signal, then everyone just does weight S, critical section, signal S. Boom, and it works. Is that slick? See how much easier it is to reason when you have, so, 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 we, so do we have mutual exclusion? Yes, actually there is a slight wrinkle to our, to our problem when we have more than one processor, more than one process rather. We do have mutual exclusion and we do have deadlock free, but guess what? Well, can you imagine what would happen if there were three processes? What? One of them might not ever get a turn. <coughs> but only under, because the other two could get in, but, but only if what? I mean, it could get another, it, it would be guaranteed to get another turn if what? if the semaphore is strong. You see, because if the, if the semaphore is strong, then once one gets in, once that one who you think would starve would get in, then the other two, and the, the other two can't get in and get out and get in and get out without having, if it's FIFO, then that, that one that, that could not be starved because, if it's, because they would eventually get in after him and it would be his turn, if it's first in, first out. So, so, so actually, with it, that's a it's an interesting thing to think about um, uh, that you don't have starvation with more than with more than two processes processes um, only if the semaphore is strong. So in the Java, you'd have to say comma true, you know, to guarantee that. Okay. So here's the abbrevi. Oh, now actually, this is an interesting. Um, we should probably do this. This is, this is an interesting um, exercise. Well, actually, no, I was going to say, here is, what he's going to do here is he's going to show, I don't think I'll go through this, but in algorithm 6.4, he's going to show us a, um, he's going to show us a scenario, a starvation scenario, okay, uh, with n processes. And here you've got a P1, and a P1, Q1, and an R1. So here he's got P, P1 executes weight, Q1 executes weight, R1 executes weight, and then as you anticipated, then um, it, it, th this, this scenario, you know, this scenario can happen. So P1 can signal, and then P1 could wait, and then R2 could signal, R2 could wait, and then what's happening is Q1's being starved, see? So, 
so it's it's it, it's it'll always it'll, it'll always be blocked if they switch back and forth. All right. So now the next example here is an example of how um, of how to do a concurrent merge sort. Uh, so this is just thinking. This is just thinking uh, about how one way that concurrency can that you, you can use concurrency in a single problem. Do you remember how the merge sort algorithm works? Well, actually, do you remember how any sort algorithm works? Using the merit sort taxonomy, what's, what are the operations? You do what? You split, and then you sort one half, and then you sort the other half, and then you join. Now, with the merge sort, what was the split? is you just cut it in half, you take the first half and the second, and they, they're not intermingled, right? Mm -hmm. So, what could you do if you had more than one core or more than one processor and you wanted to speed things up? You could have what? Each yeah, at the same time. Yeah, you could co-begin them or, you know, run them at the same time, okay? And then after you ran them at the same time, then you could, then you would do the merge, all right? So, um, so the concurrent merge sort, with the concurrent merge sort, what you do is you sort the first half and the second half concurrently. You constrain the scheduling so that the merge operation can start only after the two sorts have, have, have completed. All right? And, and this, is, this is a prerequisite scheduling problem. So check this out. This is really slick. This is a really neat ap uh, application to think about. Now, in fact, there, there is a principle here that is a really good one to, you might, this is a really valuable one to know. You might see this sometime in the near future, this concept. So a word to the wise. So check it out. Suppose we have an integer array A. What we want to do is we want to have the first half sorted recursively, uh, sorted at the same time the second half is being sorted. But then we want to schedule it so that only after both of them have been finished can we do merge the two halves. Are you with me? Now think about it. Here's what we, so here's what we're going to do. We have, we're going to have two semaphores. And these semaphores are going to be, are going to be used to schedule so that these semaphores are used to schedule so that we are uh, enforcing a prerequisite structure. You know, like when you, when you have a prerequisite to take a class, before you can take this class, what class do you have to take? You gotta take computer science 220, and you gotta take formal methods, you gotta, you gotta take uh, discrete, you know. And, and so if you follow the prerequisite system, you gotta have those finished before you can do that. Well, this is a, this is a prerequisite. The prerequisite for doing the merge is that each one of these have, have, has finished. So look, what, so the way you do it is this. You, you have this, you, say have, you have semaphore S1 initialized to zero, semaphore S2 initialized to zero. Now, and supposedly P1 and Q1 can be happening, can be started and can just execute with no constraints. They're just, they're just going until each one of them finishes. Are you with me? And they can be going concurrently on two different cores. Are you with me? Now let's suppose that P1 finishes first. When P1 finishes first and P1 does signal S1, What's going to happen? What's that going to do to S1? If you do signal, what happens if you do a signal S1 and S1 is at, is initialized to zero and there's nothing in there? What does, what does signal do? What does signal do to that semaphore? It adds one. Are you with me? And then it will just, and then it's done. It's done, all right? But now, there's three processes here. There's a P1 and Q1 and an R1, right? Now, now, and what's the first statement in R1? The first statement in R1 is wait S1. Now, suppose, suppose though that, that if, if P1 does finish and it does do the signal and it does do this, and then if R1 decides to execute, what will R1 do? What, what, what will happen then if R1 gets the processor, gets some cycles, and it tries to execute wait S1 after S, uh, P has done the signal S1. What will it do? It's wait S1, but now we said S1 is what? One. So what will it do? 
it'll subtract one and go on. But look, what if, what if, R, what if we try to start R1 before P has finished? What will, what, when it does weight S1, what will it do? It will be what? It will block. All right? And now, if in that scenario, if R1 is blocked, if, if R1 is blocked, and then eventually when P1 finishes, what will, P, what, will, what will happen at P2 when P1 finishes sorting the first half of A? It will do what? Signal S1. But now signal S1 will, will do what? Com that'll, that'll cause the completion of this one to happen. And so he'll go on to the next one. But don't you see the same thing happens with sort 2? Are you with me? So the only way we can get to R3 is if what? Is if sort 1 has, has completed, has executed signal S1 and sort 2 has completed execution of signal S2. So, th so this arrangement of the semaphores guarantees that R3 only executes after uh, P2 has executed and Q2 has executed in those processes. And that's how you can enforce uh, scheduling or with, with prerequisites. That's how you can enforce prerequisite scheduling. Does everybody see how that worked? Okay, so that's one nice application of semaphores. Here's another one. Now this other one is a, a really common one. It's called the producer-consumer problem. All right? Now, um, and here's the thing about a, 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 producer and a, a producer and a consumer. What happens is, in a producer-consumer problem, what happens is you have some common storage area, some common storage of the, of the data, and the producer is a process that's putting data into the data structure, and the consumer is taking the data out of the data structure. And you want these things to be going on concurrently, right? It's a producer. You can imagine, let's go back to the reservation system. Suppose you have a reservation system where people want to make a reservation and there's only a limited number of seats. But they also have the ability, if they change their mind, to unreserve, right? So going, all going at the same time, the producers are producing the reservations, right? There, so and so, I want this. I want this. Produce this reservation, and and all those, all that data is getting until finally, when it's full, no one can produce a reservation anymore. And if someone wants to produce a reservation, oh, sorry, sold out. You can't get in. But then, if some other people decide, oh, I cancel my reservation, boom, they come out. Then what can happen? The people who the producers then have the ability to produce. And if people keep canceling, they could cancel all the way out till it's empty. But what do you not want to have happen? You don't want to have the, the situation where, um, where they, where you can't produce more than what's available. Okay. So, in the in the producer consumer problem, and and that extra that uh, program that you were supposed to do for today, but now is due, uh, you got an extra day on it, is is an example of of a producer consumer problem with a finite buffer. Okay. So here's what we have. The assumptions are that um, we have operation append, and D is the data, and buffer is a is an array. Okay. And what this does is this appends data D, so appends puts it at the end. Okay. And then we also have operation take buffer deletes an item and returns it. Okay. Now, in this first one, we're going to say the capacity of the buffer is infinite. Now, let's think about that, the scenario where the buffer is infinite. What do you not, if the buffer is infinite, what do you not want to have happen? If the first consumer comes and tries to take from it before anything has been put in it at all, that's an error, right? Because the buffer is empty. You can't take something from an empty buffer. Are you with me? So, so, so that process, if they're, if they're operating concurrently, that process should be blocked, right? And then when producers come along and produce something, then the consumers can take out. But you can't, take, can't remove it from an empty one, okay? 
and even if the buffer is in, even if the buffer is infinite, we still have that constraint that you can't take from an empty buffer. And that's this last point. We must not delete from an empty buffer. So look, how do we do that? Here is algorithm 6.6. And look how easy it is. And now, you guys, the value of the semaphore, the value of the semaphore has meaning in this particular application. Yeah? And now, because what does it say? Semaphore, <coughs> semaphore not empty. And, what, and what, what, now what is our semaphore value initialized to? Instead of one. It's initialized to zero instead of one. And look what happens. We have a producer that's looping forever, and we have a consumer that's looping forever. Right? And what does the producer do on line P1? He produces. So the producer does D gets produce. And then, now the producer, if the, if the buffer is infinite, the producer can, there's always room to, to put it in the buffer, right? So there's no constraint on the producer whenever he's producing something. So what he does is he appends D dot buffer, and then he does a signal not empty. Now what does signal do? Add or subtract to the variable. It adds. So the producer produces one, and he adds. So, so suppose the producer produces one. Suppose the consumer is really hung, stuck for a while. And the producer produces one, and then two, and then three items, right? If the producer th produces three items, the first time he produces, the semaphore value will be one, and then it'll be two, and then it'll be three. And now suppose a consumer comes along and tries to and, and, and what is the pre-protocol for the consumer? He does what? Wait, not empty. So the first consumer to come along will do wait. But what will wait do if the value is 3? It'll just subtract 1 from it. It'll become 2. And he'll take from the buffer and he'll do his, his consume, whatever he wants to do. Right? And then suppose the second one comes along. What will happen? It'll subtract 1 and then there'll be 1 left. And then he'll just go on. And then in the meantime, if the producer produces one, he'll increment it back up to two. And then a consumer could take, and that would de decrement it to one. And then another consumer could take and decrement it to zero. And if another consumer came and tried to take it again, what would happen? It'd be empty, but he'd be blocked. Is that slick? It, is it the wait? It, it is the wait statement that, that takes away the, uh, it subtracts one from the It subtracts one, but only if it's positive. If it's zero, then it blocks. Right. But then between Q1 and Q2, it looks like something is taken from the buffer, but it hasn't actually been taken yet. Right. Okay. That is correct. Is that bad? No. Okay. Because the consumer, the producer can produce in the meantime, can interleave and produce in between those two statements, and it doesn't affect anything badly. Do you see? Because we're thinking about the interleavings are between P1, P2, P3, and Q1, Q2, Q3. So even if the producer goes, goes and produce, if, even if you have a Q1 and then a P1 and a P2 and a P3 and a P1 and P2, P3, and then a Q2, that's still fine. Do you see how that, can you visualize how that, how that works? So, so, for, so S dot B, it represents the number of items in the book. Actually, it does. That's a good point. And so the interpretation then is that S dot V represents the number of items in the buffer. Yeah, that's what that is. That's exactly what that is. Yeah. Um, might it be a problem if the consumer got in after the wait? Oh, haha. -ha. That is an interesting question. There is only one consumer okay. and one producer in this one. And in fact, why didn't I think about this before? And in fact, the scenario that you're describing is the reader's writer's problem. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, which we're going to get to. All right. Now, um, okay, so, <coughs> so in this case, in this case then, the value of S dot V has a, um, has a, uh, has an interpretation. All right. Now, I think in order to see how this, um, how uh, things can get can get blocked, um, it would. It's interesting to construct the beginning of a state transition diagram. 
And let's, I think instead of actually going through and asking you to do it, let's just, I'll just show you. Because look, what would happen if we did, what would happen if we did um, P, P, Q, Q? Now what, so, so if P executes and then P executes and then Q executes and then Q executes, what would happen? Do you see what would happen if we did, if we did P1, P2, and then Q1, Q2? Do you, can you see what the states would be? Actually, I can't resist. <laughs> if this is P1, Q1, and this is and this is the semaphore. The semaphore is zero and empty. And now also the buffer. So this is okay, so now what happens? So now tell me what happens if P executes? What's it, what's gonna be the state here? It's gonna be P2Q1. And and what's gonna be the semaphore? Is it? Hmm? It'll still be zero, right? And the empty queue. And what, but what has happened to the buffer? Let's say we put a value in the buffer. Let's just call it 10. All right, is everybody, are you with me? And then if P executes again, what, what's going to happen? Can you anticipate this one? P1, Q1. And what? One empty and what? For the buffer, still 10. Are we good? And what happens if uh, Q executes from here? P1, this is on the next slide, but P1, Q2 and what? Zero, good. You guys are good. Zero and what? Empty. Are you guys following this out in the video land? And what? Still 10. Are we good? So that's the Q. All right. And now how about and now how about if Q executes from here? If Q executes from here, what's going to happen? Yeah. And furthermore, what will it do? It will, yeah, it'll take this. So that takes it back to here. Does everybody see how that? What? Yeah. And then if Q executes from here, what happens? Oh, well, it's just, it's mirror image. Right? So look, here it is. Oh, shoot. This was the interesting one. It's the one where it's blocked. <laughs> right? If Q executes from here, it's P1, Q2 prime. So now, the, now it's doing, now it's doing wait, and so now Q, oh rats, that was the most, it, I, I said it was mirror image, it's not mirror image. So Q, so Q is blocked, right, so it's, so it's in the Q. And then finally when it, and finally when a signal happens, when a signal happens, um, so, so P has to execute, and then when P executes, that puts us in P2, and that's this interesting state, where Q2 is still blocked, but then if P executes again, it does a signal which unblocks Q2. So now the, the wait completes its execution and now we're in P1, Q2. Yeah? Now, um, and, and, then, and then we have some more, um, we're gonna do some more proofs of correctness of the producer-consumer problem. And then for, but for tomorrow, what is now due tomorrow is this uh, circular buffer problem. The bound, it's called the bounded buffer pr producer consumer problem. And there are assumptions, our assumptions here is that the capacity of the buffer is finite. You must not delete from an empty buffer. You must not insert into a full buffer. And the implementation is with a circular queue. Now, do you guys remember this from data structures? Actually, several of you are in data structures right now. And we've done this recently, have we not? Remember how that? Remember how to do that? I think we called it head and tail. He calls it in and out. And do you see how, where the data, how the data wraps around in this slide? So anyway, and he's giving, he has given us the, he's given us the code for it right here. You see the modulo n. So as all your problem is to do is to implement algorithm 6.19. 
and you can do it with this mod, you know. It doesn't have Boolean. It has mod. What's mod in C? Percent, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think we can do that for tomorrow. And then we'll talk about, talk about it some more also. All right, good deal. See you tomorrow.